This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Shamanism accepts that our physical world interacts with spiritual ones that we can communicate with through altered states of consciousness. Shamanism understands that in the inner worlds, everything is both conscious and interactive. A shamanic practitioner enters a trance state to access the collective consciousness to gather information about a person that they are making the journey for. With hypnosis, we can help clients access their own information through their own journey. This is far more beneficial than having a shamanic practitioner journey for another as we individually can get far deeper awareness and connection to our own energy streams and stories. We can activate or deactivate energy patterns or things that we know or can feel as the right thing to do. Valerie Atelis interviews Lorna Wilson, the author of Healing Journeys Through Quantum Realities, The Handbook. Lorna Wilson is an advanced hypnotherapist, shamanic practitioner, mentor, and spiritual life coach. Lorna became a close student of the late Dolores Cannon, the pioneer of the quantum healing hypnosis method. Lorna is the author of a practitioner's manual on how to conduct healing journeys into quantum realities. She's currently writing a book about healing that combines her hypnotherapy and shamanic skills. On a personal note, Lorna enjoys helping people find meaning and purpose in their lives. She is a deeply spiritual woman with a passion for unraveling the mysteries of the mind. She is very optimistic and always chooses to see the brighter perspectives presented within our life stories. As far as Lorna is concerned, a glass is never half empty, but always half full. She loves to inspire and to be inspired, and her goal and passion is to provide the sacred space where people can explore their own multidimensional soul history to help them discover the real meaning why they have been incarnated at this incredible time in Earth history. Meet Lorna at Lorna Wilson QHHTHealing.co.uk. Here's the interview with Lorna Wilson. In your own words, who is Lorna Wilson? Well, that's a big question. I'd say I'm a person that's had to live many different walks of life all within this lifetime. I feel like my life encompasses a lot of past lives all within this from many different aspects. And as a middle child growing up in the family, I tend to have been left a lot on my own, which made me an observer. So I'd sum myself up as an observer of life and consciousness and humans absolutely fascinate me. Why we do the things we do, what makes us tick. So I'd sum myself up as an observer of human beings and a participator. That sounds wonderful. So both the observer and the participant. So, yeah, that kind of taps into the paradox of life, being two things at once, but essentially being one. So my next question is about life and death. What is life? What is death? And what is the balance in between from your perspective, Lorna? Well, I think that or I know that as souls, we do not die. And when we're in our physical body, the only thing that connects us to life is our breath. And so breathing is what life is. Breathing connects us individually, all of us, to our source of life. And our breath is the only thing that accepts 
everything about us unconditionally. It doesn't care whether we're a sage or a criminal. It loves us unconditionally and it allows us to be alive. And death would be when we're actually not breathing into the physical body. And so we're fully accessing a multidimensional perspective of realities. I'm so glad you mentioned that. In a way, when I say am this here, unconditional love. Yeah, that kind of sums up to me uh, what this is all about. Not sure about, we can call it experience, um, perception, dream even. But there's something to do with that idea, doesn't it, Lorna? Unconditional love, what this is. Well, it's something that we really don't get to experience much as human beings because we have filters on our consciousness. Those might be family patterns or other things that create our beliefs and our perceptions. And along with that comes conditions So even if we want to be unconditional, we will struggle with wanting someone to like us in a certain way or not having said that. So I think the challenge of being alive is to experience conditions. So it might be that unconditional love kind of holds everything, old conditions too. It's complete. It's their wholeness. They even doesn't matter if we struggle trying to express unconditional love as a person to life itself, nature, whatever it is that we feel it's separate. But in the end, unconditional love, it's everything. It keeps coming to me. That's the only thing there is. Well, I'd agree with you. Yeah. And that's the challenge because... If we were able to just be ourselves, we would be unconditional. But it's when we interact with other people, other energy streams, other ways of thinking, divisions, that the conditions come in. But if we're able to go back into being our own formless self without the <sighs> experiences we would find that it is unconditional love because that's what keeps the energies in the universe functioning. Right. But it's a very hard, it's where we come from in many right. ways, but it's very hard to maintain that <laughs> while we're in a physical body. Especially, well, in the case of holding on to the idea that there is something separate from that unconditional reality. Yes, then everything's separate. Then we have all these, is the illusion really. Because if the only thing that's real, per se, is unconditional love, then everything else is an illusion. Yes, but I think sometimes from my discoveries, the illusion, we come into life with it. I found from doing regression um, sessions with numerous people that sometimes they go back into their creation, into the source of them coming into life. And some people feel that when they were thrown out into the physical world, some people went out with a sense of adventure or some souls, I should say, and others felt like a rejection of being pushed out from source energy that was like uh, soothing, comforting. It's like that light that people talk about when they have a near-death experience, how it's warm and welcoming. And so in hypnosis or past life regressions or quantum healing, you can go back into that. And when people explore why their lives are the way they are, they discover that, you know, that they felt that first um pulse out into life as a rejection or a separation, or for some of us, it's an adventure. So the conditions somehow can be factored in unconsciously. Talk to me for a moment about what quantum realities and quantum journeys are. I think you probably have been already talking about somehow, but more specifically, what are these two ideas? I discovered that when we go into our inner world, for example, if you think about the skin on our body, that would be an interface for the outer world and our inner world. 
And when we go into our own inner world, we discover a vast amount of experiences, um, consciousness streams of um, different thoughts and feelings and things. And so for me, a quantum journey, and quantum really, it's like the psychology of life or the psychology of the universes. And so it's like going in words into your own inner world, your own inner realities, or, you know, others that enter um, face with yours to discover far more about everything we can't really sum up and put into words. And it is a journey. It's, for example, if we go back to the breath, for us to even connect with our breath, our source of life, we pass through many levels and layers and dimensions because simply through our breath and being alive, we can access past lives, parallel lives, um, lifetime experiences of planet. And so the journey is an inward one. And I think of it like the um, infinity symbol, which is a figure eight. In my mind, I always see it laying down sideways so that it's like we go out from ourselves, searching outwards into the world, looking for something. We're always looking for something that's going to make us accept ourselves more or understand ourselves or life. It's sort of factored in that we're going to search in some way. But that journey takes us out and then it takes us back into ourselves. And then we have to go inwards and see and find meaning that's personal to us, not anyone else's experiences. So that's the journey. And the reality is, is there's a vast amount of um I call them consciousness streams of energy and vibrations and frequency. And I don't buy into there's, you know, seven dimensions or 11 or any finite number. I just think it's infinite, um, the possibilities. In fact, I had a session with someone who was a deep meditator for years, and he wanted to have a session because he wanted to go to the next level. And what he discovered throughout his whole session was these wormholes would open up or these spirals and he would or portals. These are the words he was using and describing. And he would go through one and find himself somewhere else or with um, masters or teachers or other beings or other realities. And it was so fascinating because when he finished and he came out of the hypnosis, he sat up and he looked at me and he cracked up laughing and he said, there are no other levels. There's just entry points. And so that's to me, the vastness of the realities. Interestingly, you talk about the searching for something and that's what the journey is all about. This trying to find something when everything it's already here, isn't it? But we don't know that. We we get to a plateau and we think, right, I've got it. It's all right. here. <laughs> right. But something else <laughs> sets in motion uh-huh. and a search mm-hmm. for something more or yeah. something else. But sorry, what were you going to say? I'm very attracted to that idea that uh, this is it <laughs> for some reason. It kind of makes me laugh because when you think about it, well, all these search, you know, I have been searching for myself 37 years and then not in the end because there's no ending. I was amazed. This is it. Like it is amazing. I mean, it is fascinating to be in a human body now talking to you. <laughs> this is just incredible. It's the miracle. And there's so much to learn about this specific moment in this body. It's just so unique that becomes to me uh, infinite in itself. There's no even need to search or to go anywhere. But I do understand because this is what I work now, that's what I do now, is talk and be in contact with so many healers around me too, my city. I go, I visit them, I do sessions and all, and I feel everything in the body, that the journey that you speak of. But for me, from this perspective, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's just everything goes back to here, goes back to this is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the unfortunate thing, though, is that most people are very uncomfortable in their bodies. And their our bodies holds the symptoms of every experience that we've had. 
And because of those experiences, it often makes it very uncomfortable for people to enjoy being within their own skin, so to speak. And so um, our body is fascinating. It absolutely fascinates me. And our body is recording everything. I mean, people speak of the Akashic records or the collective consciousness, but you can have something as simple as a deep tissue massage that just mm. opens up <clears throat> stories within you. That, <laughs> yes. That you yeah. didn't even realize <laughs> right. your body carries. And right. so there's no pretending <laughs> that we are enlightened or that life is great if our body doesn't feel really great or really good to be in, because then that will allow us to be grounded. And to be grounded, of course, would mean we're connected to the planet and to life itself. Yeah. So it's fascinating. It's it's it it's <laughs> it's complex and intriguing at the same time. And very simple at the same time. I learned yes. like extremely but simple, but simplicity yeah. until you get to a certain place in yes. life, and it's like. Ah, I get <laughs> right. it now. <laughs> yeah, it's like we take that deep breath and like, wow, how did, how did I miss this? <laughs> Let's talk about healing for a moment. Is all healing self-healing from your perspective? I would say yes and no. I would say yes, because we have to initiate it within ourselves. However, when we run across other people, because of their energy, their thinking, their capacity for love that they carry within them, it can sometimes trigger within us that desire to shift. And so others don't necessarily heal us. But if you think, as again, of energy, something about their energy triggers something within us that lifts us into a better feeling state of desire for something more. I feel as a change, there's something that happens, but I don't really know exactly what it is. Sometimes it feels good, sometimes it doesn't, but it's just happening. Yeah, we are activated in a way. Yeah, and I think healers give us the permission to want something more. For example, if I were to think I need a certain healing and I search for a person that I feel I resonate with, really what I'm doing is I'm finding something within myself that's projected outwards, because I can see it in that person unconsciously maybe, that will allow me to have that shift in my own self. So in, I find on earth, all humans, we are far more interconnected than we realize. We think of the differences, but we're far more similar. And so others give us what we're looking for simply because we cannot see it and feel it within ourselves, but we can see it outwardly. It's like consciousness knows itself only from experiencing it away from itself. Consciousness only knows itself by experiencing from the outside. Yeah, it cannot know itself apart from experience. So everything is an experience, even the idea of um, dreams, everything, which is interesting when we dream at night, uh, the idea of past lives and all that, everything is a dream within a dream, because in the end, everything is connected. Everything's one, isn't it? Yes, and I, that fascinates me, that concept as well, that everything is one, because Oftentimes we see and we see this separation and we feel this separation, but it's not really there. It's because we find those things we judge within ourselves. We find those things we love within ourselves. We find those things that make us feel others are different from us yeah. within ourselves. Yeah. And so somehow <laughs> it always leads us back to personalizing right. our lives. What life is, is not personal. Yeah, it's not. That's an, a very interesting idea too, concept to try to wrap the mind, you know, to it is that nothing's personal, really. So the idea of a person is an illusion itself. But we do hold on to that, don't we? <laughs> that we are this person looking for this and we have been there and we are going somewhere. And and that's where I see the suffering coming from, that idea that there is a person that's doing something. 
Well, I was going to say that the external world is designed in such a way, in my view, as to create obstacles so that it takes us deeper into ourselves. And the obstacles might be the boss that we think doesn't like us, or it might be, you know, what we hear on the news or anything. And it's almost as though those things are allowed to counterbalance us within ourselves into reaching for something higher, something better, something more meaningful. And so I see the external world, whether it's within the family or your neighbors or, you know, your area, your village, your town, the others play the role of showing us the things that makes us want to reach into a better place within ourselves, but we might not recognize it as that. And so all judgments really are um, self-judgments ultimately. And so the illusion that I'm this person is not really true. It's um, because we're, we're, we're consciousness is in everything. It's in nature, it's in animals, it's in everything, it's formless. But once we get locked into that human form, we then have the parameters and the restrictions of what it means to be a human. And so um, then we personalize and we think we're this person. And when you listen to a person that's had a near-death experience, or if you've had an out-of-body experience and you find yourself away from your body, or even lucid dreaming when you wake up in your dream and it's like, wait a second, how can I be having this conversation if I'm sleeping? You begin to realize that you're really not just a person. You're something more elusive, actually, in many ways. What are some of the misconceptions about healing, Lorna? Um, let's see, that we cannot heal because without certain things in place, healing won't happen. Um, That's not true. It's a misconception, primarily because in our early life, we wire in beliefs into our mind, into our brain about ourselves. And those beliefs will create different vibrational frequencies that will attract certain um, illnesses. And so all illnesses has a root cause. It has, they have a starting point. And if you're born with the illness, sometimes it's something within the family's patterns, or you know, it, it would be a soul choice to come in to experience that. But if it's things that occur as we go through life, you can always go back to the connecting point. So when we have illnesses, it's not that we are meant to be sick or we've done something wrong. It's simply that we've hijacked our energy in a way that has created a discomfort in our body, which is then going to affect the organs around those parts and areas of our body. So a misconception about healing is that you don't need others to heal you. Um, Because, you know, sometimes people feel, you know, I need someone else to do this for me. I feel helpless. Another misconception about healing is that sometimes we identify so much with an ailment that we've now become it rather than realizing that we're experiencing it. So illness is an experience. It is not us. It's just an experience, right? It's not who we are. And who we are, whether we're um, disabled on the exterior or not, the soul is as much alive within that body and well as if you're Michelangelo's David in human (laughs) form. (laughs) So true. <laughs> so yeah. whether whether yeah. it the external looks um, disabled mm. or um, whether you look at a child and think, oh, they're just a baby, that soul, even within the toddler, is as mature and sometimes older in perception and wisdom than an adult. So misconception is the older we are, the more opportunities we have to be wise or to... Um, have more depth is not true. 
And that to me ties in with healing because sometimes we think, you know, well, because I'm young, this and that. No, those are beliefs that we've accepted as truth. If this is a dream, which I have heard so many times, then it's okay to be in a dream. But I love the idea of knowing the nature of the dream. But since uh, since our subconscious mind doesn't sleep and it's awake in the daytime, well, our dream state is just another aspect of our awake state. It's like we blink out of one world and open our eyes to the other. So our dreams can be as meaningful, and they're all stories. I'm so glad you use that term, storylines. They're all stories. Our dreams can be as meaningful as our waking state. It's just that when in our waking state, our everyday conscious mind, that surface layer of the mind, is not designed to understand metaphor and um, analogies and symbolic things. It's designed to keep us alive in the everyday functioning world. And so when it tries to understand our dreams, it just cannot really you know, it's like, okay, no. let's pull out a dream dictionary. It must mean this. It must mean that. <laughs> Meanwhile, when we're having the dream, we're just happily going along with the dream for whatever reason, in the sense that we're accepting it as a reality. Right. So our dream state and right. our waking state right. are both mm. layers of consciousness that are the flip side of the same thing. It goes back to the idea that everything is a dream. Yes. And then it leads to the question of who is the dreamer? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> if there's no person, yeah, um, <laughs> there's no dreamer either. So that means there's nothing, <laughs> which is even more interesting, <laughs> Lorna. <laughs> and that ties in with some spiritual teachers who say that everything is nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Go back into nothingness. If everything is an illusion and there's nothing really, we create the stories, we create the um, yeah, the dream within the dream, you know. To me, is why not accept that too? Like the dream, whatever, we cannot know what's not the dream anyway. We cannot access that. So that's maybe that's why we call it nothingness. It can't be known. So there's just this, this dream world, the storytellings, and that's, uh, I mean, to me, it's just a gift. It's not really, however it comes, even if it comes with uh, illness in the body or whatever it is, it's just part of of, of the dream. And, and, and it's a gift, and it is a gift to be even aware that this is a dream. That's to me, it becomes even more interesting. Sometimes that nothingness can be experienced. For example, in deep meditation, at a time when I used to meditate a lot, I would somehow completely blank out. And next thing I know, I'd open my eyes and 20 minutes would have passed. And I would have had no recollection of anything whatsoever, where I was, what happened. It was as though it was a nothingness. Never happened, uh, as though it's it never happened. Like, where was mm. I? Where, right. You know, it's just... Uh, so I think we can have moments mm. of feeling that nothingness, but it's never long-term because somehow the body draws us back to it, the emotions draw us back, our stories draw us back into it. I mean, for example, sitting on a mountaintop, meditating out in nature with no one else to irritate you <laughs> or cause you stress <laughs> like living in a city, right. we can happily stay in that spiritual state of being at peace and nothingness. But of course, once we get back in around other <laughs> conflicting energies, nothingness is very, very hard to attain. Yeah, that's a, an interesting perspective because it sounds to me like if there is an experience of nothingness, that also means that there is a person there to perceive that. So if there's no person there, there's just life itself. It cannot experience itself. So we cannot be remembered. It's, it never happened, which is... I kind of like this for some reason. <laughs> I this <laughs> kind of like that. Never happened. There's nothing that happened. It's <laughs> happened. It will happen. So everything is just a dream. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so why not just enjoy this as a dream? That mm. word even implies sort of um, lightness, kind of playfulness, mm. doesn't it? To dream. It certainly <laughs> does. 
Um, so, Lorna, you wrote the book Healing Journeys Through Quantum Realities, the handbook. Talk to me about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book and also the purpose. Who can use this book? Only professionals like yourself, healers or anyone can benefit? Well, anyone. Um, when Dolores Cannon was alive, she had created a technique for inner exploration with the subconscious called quantum healing. And at the time, for a number of years, I was the special contributor on her forum. And I was that because I loved answering questions, because as I mentioned, humans fascinate me. So I, I worked a lot with the other practitioners, and I was already professionally trained as a hypnotherapist and a regression therapist prior to taking Dolores' technique in 2008. And so other practitioners hadn't. They had just trained with her technique. So I loved helping them, and I loved the challenge of, you know, we were having this problem, what should we do, and finding a meaningful way of helping them to help their clients. And then after Dolores... Um, past, I decided, you know, I was just not going to be on the forum anymore. My inspiration sort of wasn't there. And a number of the practitioners kept emailing me, can you help with this? Can you help with that? Can you put it all together in a book for us? And so it was the practitioners that um, pushed me to write the handbook. And I realized when I was writing it, that really anyone could use um, the techniques and get a better understanding, really, of how um, consciousness works. Primarily because when you go into your inner world, whether you go in through deep hypnosis or even, you know, light hypnosis or different brainwave states like alpha, theta, delta, or whether you're a remote viewer or... Um, a consciousness explorer, the inner worlds are the inner worlds, no matter how you enter in them. And so I wanted people to understand that there's nothing unique about someone doing a certain method or technique, because every single one of us as individuals enter into our inner world. And so I put the information so that others who aren't practitioners could um, use it and get a better understanding. And I'm actually currently writing a book now. I mean, I should have done it years ago, but it just wasn't the right time because now I'm writing a book that's combining shamanism with hypnosis and it's techniques that I've been using for years because I'm, I'm a shamanic practitioner, but rather than doing the shamanic work myself, I take people <laughs> on their own inner journeys and it's fascinating and you don't need hypnosis for that. And within minutes, um, you're, you're able to close your eyes because remember the body holds the memories of everything we've ever experienced. And our body also houses all of our feelings. And so just by connecting with our feelings, we can go right back to the original state of when something got anchored into the body and we can release the energy that's holding it. Whether we do soul retrieval, do you know something happened traumatic when you were four or five and so you've um, lost a bit of your soul essence or you've suppressed that, you can restore that energy. Um, there's things I do where if you're going through with past lives, let's just say a person's going through a tragic death, I'll have the current life um, personality who's exploring this step back from the that body and observe it at a distance, communicate to see if the body of that other life is aware of them and help them to be free of the body before the body goes through the death. I mean, it's fascinating stuff you can do. And it just confirms to me that all these lifetimes are happening all at the same time because you can interact with your own past life characters primarily because they are not your life characters. They belong to your soul. We're all aspects of our soul. And as an aspect, we can communicate with other aspects. We can integrate skills and knowledge that they have. We can release things. We can help them through the death. In fact, um, not too long ago, one person, I had her, it was a tragic death, and she was laying there cursing the person who had um, harmed her, who ended up being her sister in this current life, and they've had a bad relationship. But, um, yeah, but I had her 
step back from the body and just communicate with it. And the person who was laying there in bed dying um, saw her and he's like, oh, you must be an angel because her light was so bright. And so what it is, is when we're out of our physical body, we're seen as light. And so it makes me realize, are some of these stories we hear about angels come in to help you dine, future life characters of ours? Do you know, it's fascinating when you think about it. I've not really been able to explain it so well in a few short um, sentences. But anyhow, I'm putting it together in a book and I'm putting the techniques because I feel right now anyone, I mean, when I first heard about past lives or things, I didn't have any training back in the day. Right. So I just used to kind of experiment with my husband or make up things <laughs> with my family and yeah. explore. And I think that many of us sort of have a natural gift an awareness simply because we're born with that. You know, we've got a rich soul history. And so someone with no formal training can sit around, use some of the techniques with their friends and family, and they'll be amazed at how the results are. So I'm, I'm putting it together. There'll be, you know, sections where a practitioner can go into the depth of it, and there'll be other things that just the ordinary person can um, find relief and do their own soul retrievals or, um, yeah, soul retrievals are primarily of great importance because growing up, we disconnect from things that make us uncomfortable. We suppress energy. Yeah. We um, disconnect from our life force in different ways. And so it's restoring back to the body wholeness. I love the way you... Um set up yourself to help others to navigate into their own realities or their inner reality, just go deeper and try to understand uh, themselves. That's, that's very beautiful, Lorna. I can hear in your voice the, uh, the enthusiasm for that. Yeah, I think I was hardwired for this, really. Because as I tell you, it just fascinates me. Um, they used to call the middle child the lost child because, you know, you're too big for that. You're too little for this. And so they tend to be the observers in the family. You know, they see what's gone on ahead. They see what everyone's doing and they want everyone to be happy. They're the one in the family that wants everyone. Why don't you try this? Why don't you do this? And so it's like I'm just kind of born that way. And as I mentioned earlier, through many different lifetime experiences with many different um, people from walks of life, I just love them all. I wouldn't say I'm in love with every person, but as a human being, I just see the light of their soul within them because the exterior is all stories. It's stories they live in, stories they tell themselves, and it fascinates me. So, yeah, I just think I have... Um, information that I've gathered and I'm happy I give it away I'm happy to share it yeah it's like let's all feel better within ourselves because you mm. are me right in different ways and right. um, I right. am you right yeah I know you were cutting away telling a story too about how you came to be this but to me it's just life being life like that benevolence in the depth of it, like what the foundation of life is just trying to yeah, get us to be happier, just kind of accept the gift, however it came, however it is now. So thank you for that beautiful um, celebration. That's what it is that you're doing. You're celebrating this dream in its very unique ways. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. What is another word for healing? Love, self-love, two words. That resonates true, especially if we add the unconditional there. Mm. I might change that to mm. self-like. Mm, self -like. Loving ourselves is a loaded word and in many ways meaningless. But if we yeah. like ourselves, mm. that will move us into everything else. Two more questions. If you knew you would lose the body soon in the dream, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? No. 
I could leave my body today, I'll be fine, because I know what's on the other side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know the dream continues. <laughs> right. So. Everything's possible, yeah. <laughs> okay. And to be honest, I live yeah. every day in the awareness of my afterlife review. Yeah. So I'm always conscious about that afterlife review and I want that afterlife review to be meaningful for me rather than I should have, could have, didn't, why, and all those things. So I address those things daily, really. And my last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? That it's continuous. That no one can love you in the way that you can love yourself. And the third would be laugh more and find the humor in life. And when you say, when we say self-love, it's uh, in, when we know that everything's connected is one, then it's like everyone loves us and we love everyone because everything's connected. So self-love gains a different understanding, a different depth. To me, self-love or self-liking allows us to let others be themselves. Yeah. So we don't need to change them. Right. We can allow them to have their own experiences and their own journey. But if I don't like myself or I don't love myself, I'm going to be judging others because I'm judging myself. But if I realize I'm on a journey, then I can allow others to be on their journey. So before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Well, I have a website that I can give to you so you can, um, if you like, link it. Um, I'm based in the UK, but I work online a lot, which is fabulous because it allows me to work with people all over the world. Yeah. And I have a YouTube channel where I've put together lots of information and things for the average person to look at that has nothing to do with practitioners. I've put together some meditations. Um, I did a recent series on demystifying um, human consciousness or something like that, I titled it, so that people can understand that every single thing that they think about themselves, until they've done deep self-exploration, they're coping strategies. And so when we demystify consciousness, we are able to get back to the essence of who we are. And so that they'll find on my YouTube channel. On my website, there's loads of blogs and information um, regarding um, healing the self, or how we're composed, or just interest in things. I like to personalize things to the individual, actually, so that each person can feel a lot happier and brighter within themselves. And so those things are um, easily available. I'm on some social um, networks, um, sites, but not really. Right. So the that, YouTube that channel. Really. Yes, yeah, so the YouTube channel and my website. Lerner Wilson. Q A yeah so Q H H T stands for quantum healing hypnosis right. technique. It's a technique Dolores created, which is fabulous because it's a three part technique that communicates with your conscious mind, like how you think and feel, what's going on in your everyday life, and then your unconscious mind will reveal information that is the antidote or the solution for what's going on in your life and why it is the way it is. And then the end of the session, we speak with your, what we might call the higher conscious mind, the higher self, the soul, they're all labels really, to put it together. So it's like a story, you know, once upon a time, so and so and such and such happened. And then the filler details of the story and then the ending is and he or she lived happily ever after. And so <laughs> that's my favorite technique. So that's what quantum healing stands for. And then it's um, in the UK, so I have, you know, co-UK at the end. So it's Lorna Wilson, QHHT, healing, because it's all about healing. 
www.ex.co.uk. So I have that. I'll have on your podcast profile too. And I'll also list your YouTube channel, which is youtube.com, uh, Lorna Wilson Quantum Healing. That is the address. Thank you so much again, Lorna, and we'll talk soon. Fabulous. Thank you, Valeria. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Lorna Wilson and her work, please visit lornawilsonqhthealing.co.uk. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.